in our next session, we're on page 54 of the syllabus, and um, you can use your own Bible as well as what's in the syllabus, which is going to be the New Living Translation. Most translations are going to be pretty close when you come to the Sermon on the Mount. But this is an overview of Matthew. We move from backgrounds now to an actual uh, gospel text. And I refer you to the textbook, page 59. This is part of your reading for this uh, section of the lectures. It's a very nice summary on the essence of the gospel. Um, you know, it's very important for us to remember that you know, it's, it's what Jesus did and the message about that that is uh, key in saving people. There are lots of things that people haggle about with respect to the Bible, you know, the age of the earth, uh, Adam and Eve, how do you interpret the first three chapters of Genesis, uh, predestination and free will, uh, the meaning of the Lord's Supper, you know, all kinds of questions that people can get bogged down in. And maybe you, like me, especially when I was younger, I can remember some very fruitless discussions I had with people. And we really weren't talking about the gospel, which is what I should have been talking about. I let myself get distracted by other fruitless debates. But uh, studying the gospels reminds us that the gospels are about the gospel. And the gospel has to do with Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And in particular, if you ask me, the cross. Now, without a resurrection, the cross isn't great news. There were lots of Yahoshua's crucified by the Romans in the first century. I'll say at least a hundred and maybe a thousand, because that was one of the most common Jewish names, was Yeshua. And the Romans crucified lots and lots of men. So they crucified lots of Jesuses. But there was a particular Jesus who lived a certain life and preached a certain message, and then was crucified, and then rose from the dead. There's only one Jesus of that description, and uh, that act, that conscious act of going to the cross with, as a sinless human and uh, bearing the death of sinners in their place and then rising from the dead, that's the good news. And then people saw that, they heard that, they were witness to it, and we can doubt that all we want, and especially in the modern West, there's been a lot of doubters really uh, modern theology going back to Germany in the 1800s is, is based on skepticism. And we're still living with the fallout of that. But as one of the great skeptics said, David Friedrich Strauss, he said, if there really were eyewitnesses to this, then criticism is inappropriate. If people saw it and it happened, then it happened. And it would really be illicit then to try to pick apart something that actually was publicly viewed and widely accepted because it was part of historical reality. And the Bible presents the Gospels as something that were, this was not done in a corner. You know, it's not some esoteric mes message that somebody had a vision and then came down off the mountain and there's no proof of it. Uh, I mean, that's how I would view something like Mormonism that it claims, you know, some tablets and some things, but it's really hard to verify. I mean, you can't verify it. But we can verify lots of things in ancient history, and one of the things we can verify, if we can verify anything, would be a lot of things about Jesus, and they're verified by people that say, we saw this, we heard this, and so forth. Then you can see, and I won't read all this uh, material about the Gospels, what they are. They're most analogous to what we call biography, they have a purpose to call people to faith. Uh, I would say that a little bit differently. I, I would, and of, course, of course, this is a summary, so he's not trying to make a full statement here, but um, faith is critical, but biblical faith is based on knowledge. It's based on understanding. Now, we don't under, understand anything well enough to, to believe it like we need to believe it, but it's not a leap into the dark. You know, gospel faith is not just you hear the word Jesus 
on a radio, and you just believe in Jesus, and you, you, know, you don't know anything about who he is, you don't know anything about your sin, you, is I believe in Jesus. Uh, it's an informed trust, and, and the Gospels have as their purpose to provide the knowledge necessary to make an informed commitment to the subject of the Gospels, who's Jesus. Uh, seven says why we needed, or why uh, in the first century written Gospels were needed, and then uh, eight summarizes why they are trustworthy. That's what we know about the Gospels. Another thing we know about the Gospels, and I think this is the only time I do this on this particular set of handouts, but I have blanks for you to fill in. And a lot of people hate these because they feel like they're back in first grade or something. So please don't have a flashback if, if you hate fill in the blanks. I, I only do it once in a while. But uh, you can see here an acronym P-M-E-E-C. I actually learned this when I was an undergraduate way, way back in the 1970s, late 1970s. And I've used it many, many times to orient my understanding of the Bible. Uh, the Old Testament is the preparation for the gospel. The Old Testament is the preparation for the gospel. That's the P. And then M, the gospels are the manifestation of the gospel. And of course, the gospel is the good news of, of God's redemption in his son. Acts describes the expansion of the gospel. And think of trying to go from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John to Romans. It would be impossible. You wouldn't know what, what you know, it's like two religions, but Acts is that very important link that shows us how you go from Jesus crucified and uh, in some of the Gospels risen, in other Gospels he's just crucified and you know, he doesn't ascend. Um, Acts is the bridge and shows us how the Gospel goes out into the Roman world. The Epistles provide the explanation of the Gospel, or if you like to be fancy, the explication of the Gospel. They're more than just an explanation. They really draw it out and apply it. And then Revelation describes, I bet somebody can guess. Consummation. The consummation of the good news. The gospel. World redemption. The age to come. So that's the first point we'll make with respect to uh, Matthew. It's sort of um, the lead, he's the lead-off hitter when it comes to moving from the preparation to the manifestation. And I'll say more about that in just a minute. On page 71 of your textbook, we see 10 points uh, that sort of summarize major things to know either about Matthew's composition, uh, his purpose, how he goes about what he has to say, uh, what kinds of emphases he makes, what he focuses on, how he highlights Jesus as a teacher, and also the interesting fact that Matthew's the only gospel that mentions the church by name. And I think this is one of the ways that we can say, you know, these, these documents probably are historically uh, genuine because if they were written way after the fact and you were trying to make Jesus out to be the founder of the church in a way that would be the way I would like to see it, I'd, I'd like to see the church right from the beginning rather than three gospels that don't even mention the church. But there was a transition that had to be made. And there was a, if you will use a musical term, there was a key modulation. There was a big key modulation between the people of God into which Jesus was born and the people of God as they were going to be constituted by a generation after he died. Uh, there were going to have to be seismic shifts in the self-understanding of the people of God. And... Uh, for that reason, it's not surprising that Jesus doesn't talk about the church because while 
I think he knows and even foretells in other words that uh, there's going to be a whole horde of people in times to come that call on his name. He's starting with it then and there, and it's, uh, it's a very small remnant. And he's going to leave it to history and to God the Father and to the Holy Spirit and to his disciples and apostles. He's going to leave it to them to get out and to found the church proper. That's not really what he came to do. He came to minister to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and to establish a beachhead from which uh, subsequently the church could be formed. So I'll just leave you there with, with uh, number two uh, in that page 71. Um, I did bring into the notes some matters of emphasis in Matthew. Um, and you'll see one through five, the Sermon on the Mount, the choosing and sending of the twelve, the parable chapter, the kingdom section, and the Olivet Discourse. Uh, scholars have tried to do a lot with the fiveness because there are five books of Moses. And uh, as I say, uh, eventually in this handout, in all kinds of ways, and as uh, one of you said to me or over the break, you know, Matthew seems to be written particularly to Jewish readership. And I think that's true. And Jesus is presented in Matthew, some have tried to say, as the new Torah, or the true Torah, or the fulfillment of Moses. And there, there's something to that, and I don't think we can, or we, that we need to push it to the point that somehow the Gospel of Matthew is like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, but it is a nice coincidence and in any case, it, it, this calls our attention to the fact that there are these long discourses. And um, in a sense, they give us, you could say, the narrative flow of Matthew. As, as it says on your handout, uh, there's a refrain at the end of each of these five sections. When Jesus had finished these sayings or, or things, the narrative sections appropriately lead up to the discourses. And then the gospel has a fitting prologue, including a genealogy, and then just, you know, some uh, prolegomena like John the Baptist's ministry and, and Jesus, you know, choosing disciples and so forth. Then you get into the first discourse of the Sermon on the Mount. And then you get this challenging epilogue, which we'll come back to, which really uh, involves us. The end of Matthew involves us. Matthew contains over 60 Old Testament quotations, more than twice as many as any other gospel, which, you know, again, would appeal to or would uh, be significant for a Jewish reader. He views the good news in terms of its fulfillment of Old Testament expectation. Ten of these quotations use a distinct introductory formula containing the word fulfill in Greek. And we've looked at uh, most, if not all of these, already in another connection. But there they are lined out with the Old Testament references. Matthew is ideally placed in the PMEEC scheme as the bridge from Malachi to the New Testament. And the more you study the Old Testament, the more you realize, you know, Malachi really is, you know, the cherry on the top of the Sunday. <laughs> Malachi is a is a perfect conclusion to this melee of revelations and developments and uh, revolutions and devolutions that make up Old Testament history. Malachi is a very significant last word of God to his people. And, you know, you could, you could wonder, okay, how's God going to restart this thing? How's he going to reboot? And none of the Gospels does as good of a job as functioning as the bridge as Matthew. So I think it's uh, not uh, just a, a happenstance of uh, 
however we got the order of the Gospels, I think it's sort of an inexorable logic that if, uh, if, if somebody doesn't think of it and, and you know, say, let's put Matthew at the front, then God choreographed it. So that as we read God's word, we move from Malachi. Uh, we don't go to John, we don't go to Mark, we go to Matthew, and we cannot avoid the close connection. Uh, this is the same God. This is the same promise. This is the same heritage. For all of its differences, it's a fulfillment of something that came before. Remember a big difference in our thinking and in uh, the thinking of antiquity. And actually, a lot of this an antiquity thinking is still alive in various parts of the world today. It's just we live in Western consumer society. What's true and the best now is what's the newest. New and improved. And uh, that sells. And our whole economy is based on the notion that to get the best, you know, we need the best science, we need the best car, we need the best phone. It's tragic, but I just can't help laughing about the new Samsung. Two or three times a day you see a new car or building that's been set on fire by this new device. And the batteries are like blowing up and catching fire and... It's a, it's a real tragedy, but it's like a commentary on modern technology. Well, in antiquity, the thing that was true was the thing that was original. You know, the thing that was at the beginning, which is why Genesis starts with, in the beginning, this is how it was. And John's Gospel starts out, in the beginning was the word. So Matthew connects us with the, with the beginning, connects us with where things started out uh, in God's saving economy. Another important emphasis on, in Matthew is Christ's authority. To give just eight examples, first in his teachings, Jesus often employs term like King, Lord, Master in reference to himself. Second, he claims to be greater than the great King Solomon, and he claims Davidic authority. That's significant, especially in Judaism. Uh, Zion, Jerusalem, was the city of David. Third, 29 times he uses the authoritative Old Testament title, Son of Man of himself, in Matthew. Uh, dozens of other times in other Gospels. Fourth, he claims knowledge of the future judgment and authoritative role in the judgment. Uh, fifth, he declares who gets in the kingdom and who doesn't. Sixth, he gives many God-like authority claims. And if you look at this reference work, uh, over two dozen passages where Jesus claims God-like authority. And then seventh, in recognizing uh, his divine authority, he's worshipped. And I highlight these, so that might mean that it would be a good idea to look at them. So I'll real quickly uh, project them to 11. And 8, 2, and 14, 33, and 28, 9, and 17. He's worshipped as a child. The man with leprosy came and knelt before him. Matthew 14, 33, those who were in the boat worshipped him. You know, if you know your scriptures, you know that when humans bow down before angels, what do the angels say? Get up. <laughs> uh, I may be a heavenly being, but I ain't God. There's only one person that we're allowed to worship. We shall have no other gods, not even angels, before God. But Jesus is worshipped, and he doesn't rebuke people. 28.9, they clasp his feet and worship him. 28.17, they worship him even though some doubted. And eighth, the religious and political authorities notice and question Jesus' authority. As I said a minute ago, uh, that's why, one of the reasons they wanted to put him to death, because the spiritual authority he was claiming for himself was just over the top. You can't go around calling God your own father. What would that mean about you? You can't go around forgiving sins but Jesus was doing things like this. So 
This is a very rough overview of Matthew. Some of the things that are distinct to it that, you know, make it unlike other Gospels. Of course, the four Gospels testify to one Gospel. But part of moving from beyond, you know, sun, from, from Sunday school, knowledge of the Bible, to next levels is really for the particularity of the representation of Jesus in different Gospels to, to crystallize. And uh, you begin to see that... Uh, in the wisdom of God and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Matthew goes about his business in a somewhat different way than Mark, Luke, and John does. And I think that's really, really good. And the way I look at it is this, and I, I mention this at various times in, I think, the course of my lectures, because it's so important for how facts are established before the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every fact be established. And that kind of goes back to eyewitnesses. There's a jurisprudence of eyewitness in Scripture. And the way we know things happened is that God does them, and he sees to it that witnesses are there, and then people proclaim they witness to what it is they've seen and heard that God has done. And then if you want to be right with God, you've got to accept what God has shown to these witnesses. And maybe sometimes you and I are witnesses too, but they're just the, most of the things in the Bible you and I don't see. We have to take it from other people. And that's by design. You know, that's God's wisdom. There's only one Moses. There's only one Abraham. There's only one Isaiah. There's only, certainly only one Jesus Christ. And um, each of the four Gospels is a witness. And it's not just two. And it's not even just three. It's like, I mean, three witnesses would be all you could possibly ask for on the basis of the Word of God. But it's four testimonies. Four authoritative eyewitness testimonies to Jesus the Christ. And uh, maybe God, you know, had a little bit of uh, Jewish humor in mind when he said, I'm going to give them three plus one so that they won't doubt the uh, definitive self-manifestation of divinity in the world through my son. I'll see you at the next session. Thank you.